in a row. I mean, what's happening here? I know, right? Hello, yeah. chat. Hello. It is Sunday. We're doing a cover reveal. Woohoo! I know. We are doing a cover reveal for the third book in the Emergence series, The Twins by Kelly Lynn Colby. She is normally your host for this show, but today I, SG George, uh, editor extraordinaire and um, acquisitions editor for Cursed Dragon Ship Publishing, will be running this ship. Isn't that scary? Nope. It's comforting. I like it. But the lady of the hour, Kelly Lynn Colby, um, owns one hat but wears many she is a writer of epic fantasy uh and paranormal thrillers a freelance editor a publisher and a podcaster as the editorial director and publisher at curse dragonship publishing kelly is privileged to work with a plethora of speculative fiction writers she decided everyone else should get to know them as well so she started the 20 questions with your favorite author podcast where she talks to authors every tuesday um asking why they'd agree to be on this podcast and other hard-hitting questions um they used to do a D and D adventure nights, but now I believe they just play regular games. With mm-hmm. being the mic, Kelly writes and edits and answers an inordinate number of emails at her cluttered desk, coffee shops, parks, and parks mostly in Houston, Texas. You can follow her adventures on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at K Colby Writes, or subscribe to her blog at kellylynncolby dot com. Or you can see her here at Curse Dragon Ship. On Twitch TV. Which is much more secure to find me here. I spend a lot more time here than my own personal stuff. Sadly or yay, I don't know, but it's just a matter of fact. It just means, like, you're all concentrated in one area. So that when we really need a high dose of Kelly, like, we know where to go. That's need a high dose of Kelly. I like how you put that. That's exactly right. Uh So... What was it like writing a book three? This is your first book three. It is. It was weird. It's it's weird to just keep the because I have the two book series, um, but this is my first third book. So it was it wasn't as hard as the second book because the second book you have to figure out what to repeat and what not to repeat. You know what to remind people on, but don't jump too much backstory. By the time you get to the third book, I mean people have read the first two. There the odds of just picking up the third book are, are not as big um and plus if you just pick up the third book it spoils so much from the earlier ones right so i wasn't as concerned about filling them in and the reminding people of what happened in the other books it just seemed to flow easier so that was kind of nice the hard part was raising the stakes because we have a third book now right so now i've got to raise the stakes even higher what now does fauna have to face you know what's the new thing right she's already faced who she is as an empath, she's already faced her family. So what's next? So it, that was the that was the hardest part. All right. Well, let us not tease the audience any further. Let's reveal the cover. Dun 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 dun. I see, see the magic. Yes. Yeah, that's the first book. There it is. The twins. twins. Yeah, Stephanie saw yet again did an incredible job. Sadly, she could not be with us because she's in Indonesia. So this is literally the crack of dawn for her. But um, but she rocked it yet again. You mean not everybody keeps night shift? <laughs> nope. Sorry, that's you and your family right now. <laughs> Let's get a little bit more into what the book is about with the back cover. So Fauna's familiar bonds continue to strengthen as her circle expands. Reconciliation with her brothers, unwavering acceptance from her closest companions, and the soaring heights of her romantic relationship all paint a brighter picture. Yet an elusive void persists within her. Unexplainable enchantments in her empath... Em- Static abilities beyond emotional perception leave her unsettled. 
This phenomenon, seemingly unprecedented, casts a veil of curiosity over her existence. Fauna, however, refuses to let uncertainty cloud her resolve for long. Guided by the knowledge gleaned from the collective, she masters the art of managing her newfound powers, adaptly concealing them when discretion demands. But the tranquil facade shatters when her uncle resurfaces, accompanied by a pair of adopted twins endowed with a remarkable cap capacity to manipulate fire. As inexplicable fire-induced homicides unfurl around them, Fauna finds herself compelled to unearth the truth behind these events and confront her uncle's involvement. Failure is not an option. The twins' fate hang in the balance, teetering perilously close to the torment Fauna herself or Fauna herself endured in her formative years. The impending peril propels her on a quest to decipher the mysteries at hand with the lives of the twins and her own hard-won equilibrium on the line. Ooh. Mysterious, as one does for a mystery. Right? It, it's kind of within the theme. So in the past two covers and the past books like houston has not only been like a setting but a character is that the same for this one as well for sure yeah houston's definitely still a character in this so i didn't want to make up new worlds like i did before so and the first book shows a lot of um the heights the second book there is the george r brown and the um edo which is east houston so we call it east downtown so it's called edo and had that kind of setting and this one is more right downtown it's got one very fancy restaurant um that she goes to with tucker and it's got an office building that i did not name a specific office building because it's a it's a law office and all that so again you still have to make some things up right so i didn't name a specific but the very feel of it and what's going on there is still very very houston so the picture this time was right right dab in the center of downtown anyone from houston will recognize this you drive under it on a regular basis, and it's on a lot of of posters and stuff of Houston. And, you know, the funny part is when Stephanie put it on there first, she got rid of the little oval thing. She was like, well, I didn't like it because it looks like an outline ball. I'm like, no, no, no. It's not. No one can tell what city it is unless you leave that oval in. That is the iconic part. She was like, oh, okay, I'll put it back in then. <laughs> Otherwise, it could have been any darn big city in the world, right? So putting that specific part in, now you know for sure it's Houston. So awesome mm -hmm. tucker keeps getting brought up you are bringing more of the romance into this one i am i can't believe the first book i wrote i completely forgot to add romance and now i'm like doubling down man this romance is fun i don't know why i forgot it it just adds a lot especially to someone who has been fighting against it because being intimate with people can hurt her like physically not just emotionally like the rest of us right um, and so she's trying to figure out how to make that work. Y you know, they say, man, I wish I could read your mind, but do you really want to read? You know, that's it's probably not a good idea. And she can't read minds. But when you can read emotions that intimately, it's pretty close to that. Right. You know, like nobody can lie to you and say, oh, yeah, you look great in that dress. But inside they're going, oh, God, please wear anything else. Right. Like they can't lie to her. There's no little white lies <laughs> in Fauna's life. She knows. Um, so that kind of thing is, is hard for her to be that vulnerable, quite frankly. And so the fact that Tucker is such a great guy, um, it's kind of helping her open up, but she has not told him who, what she can do. <gasps> She's not told him. So she has to decide, is this going to move forward? Should I just leave now? Like, is this too much? You know, it's one of those, should I run away instead of have be rejected? Uh, so she's going back and forth. So this is the moment. This is where we actually see, you know, how much Tucker can actually handle and how much it actually works or not for Fauna. So that happens in uh, this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of murder and mystery. And oh, that's just the side. That's just, you know, not nearly as much. Um, and so along with her, um, boyfriend, she also has her best friends. Are they also still a big part of her life in this one? 
They are. Um, but if anyone remembers the end of book two, I won't say for anyone who's missed it, which, by the way, if anyone's missed this train, you need to jump on. These books are fun. And Zafo can put up the the link for the first um, the first one. And they're like 200 pages. These are real quick reads, too. So keep that in mind. Um, so these are real quick. Sit down and, and go through it and go, ooh, where's the next one? That's that kind of the point of these. So the first book is up called The Collector. That link is up now if you would like to get that. And it's in Kindle Unlimited. So if you have that, you can read it for free. And for um, something happens in the last book um, that I can't actually say. Something with her friends, um, uh, with Amelia specifically. And, of course, she shared it with Gina. That made them a little bit scared of her. A little bit scared of Fauna. They accept who she is, um, but, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the first time Superman shows how strong he is and you realize he could, like, accidentally flick you across the room and kill you, right? Like, you're like, ooh, I don't I, I don't know how safe I am anymore with this power. So um, there's, even though they're still her close friends, they're a little more withdrawn than they were before. So she's getting closer to Tucker, farther away from her friends, and now there's more family involved. So they, she has more extended family that have come into the picture. So she's got a lot of stuff she's trying to deal with. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then do you want to read a sample of the book? I do under the caveat that I am not a narrator and it's why we pay professionals. So as long as everyone understands that, um, I'm going to read a section. It's actually chapter three in the new one. Um, it is, I don't like to read the beginning cause you can read that for free on Amazon. Um, so it's chapter three and this is uh, the collective, which is a group she found um, from the first book who they are um, all um, empaths. So they are like her, they understand her, and they've been working together to try to make life a, a bit more bearable, you know, as a support group, as we all need of some sort, right? Right. So we're going to read about that. Um, so the Tracy Gear Community, the, now I said it wrong, the Tracy Gear Community Center, which by the way, is a real place in Houston. So I tried to use as much of actual Houston as I could. The Tracy Gee Community Center glowed under the yellowed lights of the parking lot. This place hosted the group who saved my life, or at least made it a bit more bearable. I tried to convince them to take our weekly meetings to a bar, but the collective voted to keep it at this modest one-story building, tucked in between much larger high-rises. It was the last place they'd seen Deborah alive, which somehow made it holy to them. I barely knew her, but still felt responsible for her death. Who was I, who was I to demand a move? Inside, the mildew inherent to most buildings over a decade old in Houston, mixed with stale perfume and old sweat from the yoga class. After months of entering these doors, the odor comforted me and programmed my brain like Pavlov's dogs to soften my stress and prepare to open up and hear and listen. Not sure I'd order a candle with that particular scent, but I appreciated the effect. Welcome, Fauna. We'll get started in a moment. Rodney's running late. A demi greeted me with warmth but stern determination. She didn't like when things ran behind schedule. Her fabric design business likely ran like a well-oiled machine. That made me wonder if she needed technical support. I could add a Demi's World Designs to my roster. With a gentle wave at Enrique, who leaned conspiratorially close to Margaret, whom he had giggling, probably with some dirty story, I moved toward Belinda at her normal spot pacing by the window. She never spoke, but her face usually communicated anything we needed to know. I'd once asked why she was mute. Ademi explained that Belinda had been through serious trauma when she was young and hadn't uttered a word since. Apparently, Belinda came from a wealthy family, and even with the best tutors, she never managed to learn sign language. Whether from willful stubbornness or because it never clicked, no one knew. She could read and write just fine, though, and use that skill whenever it became crucial for her to communicate a finer point. Nevertheless, Belinda chose to use her, facial, her face to express her thoughts. Not that the people in this particular group needed the facial expressions to read her emotions. While we awaited Rodney, it was a good time to ask Belinda for a favor. Hey, girl. Her feet slowed their movement, though she still bounced a bit in one spot. How much coffee had she drank? Belinda's genuine smile at my greeting flowed her happiness into my toes and fingers. Now that I had my empathy under control, the flow of others' emotions manifested as a minor memory of a feeling instead of an overwhelming tsunami of force. Can I ask a favor? She tilted her head, her graying hair slipping to one side of her face. Would you mind coming to a kid's soccer game with me tomorrow? My uncle's adopted twins might be empaths, and I was hoping for a second opinion. Belinda clapped her hands together and offered a full-toothed grin. 
You do love discovering more people for our club, don't you? A sharp nod showed her agreement with my statement. Rodney rushed into the room, his anxiety pushing ahead of him, making all of us turn at once. Ha! I made it! Houston traffic will not thwart me. Ademi's red-painted lips quirked up on one side as she took her seat, the cue for the rest of us to sit as well. Everyone except Belinda, of course. So, who has news to share? Enrique leaned against the back of his chair and crossed his legs. I have a new boyfriend. Belinda scoffed and Margaret giggled. Ademi didn't look amused. You have a new boyfriend every week. I don't think that counts as news any longer. With his head cocked, Enrique studied his manicured fingernails. I can't help how irresistible I am. Ademi's expression grew sterner. It doesn't count as irresistible if you manipulate their emotions. The pout that scrunched Enrique's face made him look even hotter somehow. I wasn't sure it was solely his empathic ability that kept the men focused on him. He said in his own defense, I can't always help it. If I'm attracted to a man, my emotions kind of latch onto them as well. Finally, breathing normally after his dash from the parking lot, Rodney shook his head in disapproval. You know that's an excuse. We've all been working on how to control what we can do so we don't hurt anyone else or remove their free will. Ademi added, or hurt ourselves. Now that I can relate to. I had a much better grip on my emotional empathy, but very little on my healing ability. So what do you expect me to do? Complained Enrique. Though my itchy scalp told me how irritated he was, I didn't need the extra help since his feelings were clear with his tightly crossed arms and bouncing foot. So I closed off my empathy just a bit by thickening the walls around my mental barrier. I'd gotten so good at constructing the thing every morning that I barely remembered it was there, and yet it still worked. I had no idea why it didn't work on the healing part of empathy. Ironic that I learned the technique from this group, and Enrique still refused to use it. Have you been practicing your mental barrier? He dropped his head behind his chair and let his arms fall to his side. It's so boring. How empty and gray everything feels when that barrier's up. He wasn't wrong, but missed the whole point. Sure, it's a bit quieter in my brain, but it's a lot easier to get work done without spiral spiraling into someone else's bad day. Rodney brought home the point. What happened when the poodle owner had a temper tantrum? Reluctantly, Enrique met his gaze. I lost it too and painted the dog pink. Margaret covered her mouth. You did not. And Demi didn't let him stop there. And how did that work out for you? Belinda put her comforting hand on Enrique's shoulder. The young man dropped his attitude and rubbed his face with both hands. Not well. The social media campaign wiped out 15% of my business. I probably would have lost all of it if that asshole hadn't been caught drugging his dogs to perform better at the show. His loss of reputation saved my business. Proving why she was the right person to take over leadership of our group, Ademi knelt down in front of Enrique and made him look her in the eye. So you have to do something. If the mental barrier isn't working for you, then we need to try another technique. There were other techniques. Huh. Maybe something would suppress the aggressive healing ability. Heidi could handle it just fine after all, but she didn't have emotional empathy to balance as well. I could really use another technique too. I've been wholly unsuccessful with suppressing my healing ability. We can learn together, Enrique. After brushing his cheek with the back of his hand, he nodded. All right, Ademi. What have you got in your bag of tricks? Dun, dun, dun. Very nice. Oh, it's so good. And I like it. It did a really good job of catching anybody up in, in that little section. If you didn't know about how her powers worked or who these people were, you did a really good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's nice. And plus, it's a support group. Yeah. And all of us have a support group. If you don't, you need one for something, right? Like, I have a writer's group I meet together. So we talk about writing and things that are helping and, and stuff in our life that is affecting our writing or, you know, that. So this kind of support group, even though, you know, we're not empaths, this kind of support group should be pretty universally understood. Um, so I'm hoping that also will come across. Very nice. Where can people get book one and book two in preparation of book three? Uh, well, Zafo has the link up, but you can go to Amazon.com and search for uh, The Collector. Uh, book two is The Healer. They are all in the Emergence series. And as you get to the end of book two and the beginning of book three, um, where Emergence comes from should start to become very clear um, why it's called that. And... Um, 
They can find it on Amazon.com. And the paperback is available anywhere you get paperbacks. So if you prefer paperback, you can just go to Barnes & Noble and order it um, or get it anywhere that they are sold. You can even go to your local bookstore and order it from there. So if you have your little indie bookstore that you want to support, you can order it from there. Um, but ebook that is only available on Amazon, uh, Kindle Unlimited. There you go. And when is book three coming out? Uh, it's October 24th. So that is right around the corner, Tuesday, October 24th at 8 p.m. Central, right here, twitch.tv slash Cursed Dragon Ship. Yep, we're going to have another show, and we're going to have a good time, and we're going to give away some books, huh? Yes, I will give away two signed copies, so I am very excited about that. Perfect. And then um, they can follow Cursed Dragon Ship on Instagram and Facebook if they want to be notified when the launch happens. Absolutely. We'll keep you informed, let you know. And when the pre-order goes up for book three. So if you already have yep. book one and two and you really are just waiting for that pre-order, we'll let you know when that goes up. It just hasn't quite been approved yet. So, you know, we have to wait for the powers that be to say, sure, you can put this up for pre-order. So as soon as that happens, we will make sure everyone knows. Yes, we will. Then in your cover artist did a fantastic job, as always. Yep. Like all three of the covers look really well put together. Yes, right? They match. They look so pretty. So, and they, they should be showing, like, the, you know, the the transition yep. as Fauna goes through what she's going through. So, I'm so excited. It's coming together so nicely. And hopefully the readers feel that same excitement that I do. Oh, I'm sure. You've done a fantastic job with them so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anything else that we would like to let the people know about? I don't know. Does anyone have any questions? Let's any see. Questions. Oh, is the pre-order link ready? It... What? It got ready right at the end? I am so excited. This is how Zapho earns his pay. <laughs> Look at that. Pre-order is up and ready. Thank you, Amazon. You rocked it, man. There we go. So if you would like to pre-order book three right there, it does help us out, um, help the author out if there is a good showing at the launch. Um, so if we get a couple books sold, even two, three, it really um, bumps it up in the rankings so that Amazon starts pushing it out to other people. That's right. So if you're going to get it anyway, order it now. That's right. And then it just shows up. I do that with my favorite authors, period, right? Like Kim Harrison is always on pre-order. It's like... <laughs> As soon as the pre-order goes up, it's just on. And suddenly I'm like, oh, look, the new book came out. It's in my Kindle. So it's kind of nice, too. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming along. And hopefully we can get Stephanie on one of these days. She just has to stay up till 4 a.m. I mean, it's not a big deal. Or maybe you host it at 4 a.m. Houston time, and then it'll be 3 p.m. her time. That shouldn't be a problem at all. Yeah, it should totally work. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Not doing that. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. 